Is true altruism possible? And what's the impact of altruism in our minds? Today we go beyond with Elizabeth Svoboda, an award-winning science writer who has contributed to the Washington Post, Discover Magazine, Psychology Today, and many other publications. Her first book is What Makes a Hero? The Surprising Science of Selflessness. And her most recent book for children is The Life Heroic, How to Unleash Your Most Amazing Self. She lives in San Jose, California with her husband and two young sons. Let's go beyond with Elizabeth Svoboda. Go beyond, beyond your horizons. All right, here we are with Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you so much for connecting to the spacecraft today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be on board. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'm very excited because uh, with Elizabeth, we're going to have an amazing conversation going through a variety of topics. We're going to speak about uh, mental health. Uh, we want to speak about heroism, uh, about suffering and selflessness. We also going to speak about intelligence and IQ tests and even about dinosaurs and detective work. So I want to begin, I want to begin with mental health because, you know, everybody is uh, interested in mental health. And in, in the article, in this article that you wrote, I was really uh, impressed when I read that um, 83%, 83% of people during their lives uh, have suffered either a short-lived or a long-term mental disorder. And of course, uh, our audience will be wondering who are the other 17%? Uh, you know, who are these people? How are they? Can we learn something about them? So can you tell us uh, something about, first of all, this 83%, this is crazily, uh, crazily huge. I mean, why, why is this happening and who are these 17% lucky ones? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I think initially when a lot of people hear that 83% number, they're like, oh my goodness, that's ridiculously high. I never would have thought it would be that high. But the rate that, that they reached that number was they actually have a group of people in New Zealand that they've been surveying from almost the beginning of their lives every wow. five years. They do these in-depth per personality surveys, health surveys, and when you do really detailed tracking of a population like that, what you see is that you do have this almost four in five people experiencing some kind of symptoms of mental disorders. Now, in the real world, outside the context of a study, you're probably not gonna have 80% of people saying, oh, I, I've been depressed, this and that. Mm -hmm. But when you do this tracking, when you do the detailed diagnosis, this is the figure that comes out of that. So. I, I see that as, well, this is a reason not to have the stigma that currently surrounds mental disorder, because the truth is that four in five of us are experiencing that at some point um, it, within the first half of our lives. And I mean, so I mean that, you know, exactly let's that. putting, I mean, let's put this in context for, for our audience. This means that when you are with four of your friends and you are five people, four of you, four of you very likely are having some mental disorder. I mean, this is this is crazy. This is huge. Um, okay, okay. So, uh, and this is very interesting. So, this study was following people from the beginning of their lives. So, this is really a, a deep, detailed study. Yeah, right. Following right from the beginning, and then leading through, I think, some pretty turbulent years for a lot of people. In college, you have a lot of changes when you're yeah. looking for your first job, um, big life transitions, such as marriage, having your first kid. Um, we tend to celebrate these as very positive things, and in many ways they are, but they can also be very, very disorienting in ways that not everybody is willing to acknowledge, and I think that's part of what's at work here. Do you think this this uh, makes me wonder? I mean, you know, when it is four out of five, do you think that many times uh, people that have uh, depression or a mental disorder they just don't know that they have it? I mean, they they don't think they have it. Is that is, is this 
is this because they is it denial or is it that they really that many times we're just not aware of things I think there may be some degree of denial, but I think many of us just are not aware, especially if you've been in a depressed state for years on end, which in a disorder called dysthymia, it's sort of like a constant state of low grade depression. And when you're in that type of situation, you may not realize that this is different from what a lot of people feel when they're happy. You just take it as this is normal for me, this is to be expected. And so you may not even be asking yourself a question of, do I need to see a therapist? Is this abnormal? Because you've just internalized it as your normal. Very, very interesting. So now let's say, uh, okay, we're going to look at both sides, but who are these 17% lucky ones? Well, that's a great question, and it's one that science is just beginning to explore. But what the researchers have found so far is that they don't necessarily tend to be the people with the surface advantages. They're not necessarily the people who come from very well-off families or who are extremely intelligent or who have what we would think of as these baked-in advantages. Um, being temperamentally blessed, as I call it in the story, seems to be much more about how you respond to what happens to you. So what we see in this blessed 17%, if, if you can put it that way, is that they tend to be very tolerant of other people in their lives. They mm-hmm. don't overreact to the things that happen to them. They have a way of sort of deploying their emotional stabilizers, as I like to put it, so that even if something that many of us would really consider very disorienting happens, we're diagnosed with a life-threatening illness or somebody in our family experiences an event like that, that they still, even in these very extreme times, they're able to deploy their stabilizers and sail through because they don't overreact to, to what happens to them, whatever it might be. Very interesting. So is this emotional stability and this resilience? Now, a lot of people will be wondering how much of this is genetic? How much of this is genetic and how much can be tweaked, you know? Right. Uh, Of course, as with most things in in biology, it does seem to be a mixture of both. Mm -hmm. These people who are in the 17% they also did not tend to be related to people who had mental disorders either. So they tended Mm. to come from these families where maybe several other members are also temperamentally blessed. So that shows us that at least some degree of it may be due to genetics, but Mm. there's also evidence that this kind of emotional stability can be taught or learned to a certain degree. When you look at something like, dialectical behavior therapy that is designed specifically to teach emotional management skills, emotional stability. So even if you are one of the unlucky ones in the sense that you're born being emotionally labile, you feel a lot of these up and down swings, you can learn to moderate that by by using some of these techniques that have been tested in research. This is this is so interesting. And and what do you think uh, this this makes me think about something? Um, do you think that in the future, I don't know how is the research uh, about this nowadays, but uh, do you think there will be like, you know, okay, nowadays we have Prozac and all this stuff, but do you think in the, in the I don't know, in the next decade, uh, we will have a, a new kind of, a, you know, pharmacological solution that will allow to tweak uh, our response to stress and emotional, you know, ups and downs? Uh, in, 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 with much more precision? I certainly hope so. As you know, the landscape of depression medication, anxiety medication, it's been basically most of the same options for decades on yeah. end. People who took Prozac in the 80s, you know, they're still pretty much taking it today. So something where we look more closely at this cohort of people who are temperamentally blessed and who do very well under these stressful circumstances Is there a genetic signature? Are there certain proteins that they're making that maybe the rest of us are not making? And so this is still something that has not been determined yet. We're just at the very beginning of this research, but it's certainly something that I would say over the next 10 or 20 years, if we look at this more closely, it could be very fruitful. 
Very, very interesting. And of course, there is there is always that um, that duality when well, you know a lot of people have this kind of low uh, you know low degree of depression, this kind of you know subtle form of depression. And there is always this question: if this kind of people uh, really need you know like antidepressant or something like that, or they just need to you know change their life lifestyle and or you know. I mean, there are there is a lot of controversy also, and a lot of different opinions uh, regarding this. Uh, what, what is your your own opinion? I mean, do I mean, what is the role, you know, this balance between lifestyle? Uh, I mean, in regards to mental disorders, the balance between lifestyle versus you know the help of uh, uh, you know medicines and pills. What is uh, that balance? What What's your opinion about that balance? You know, what is the balance? Yeah. As you know, that that is a huge question, and I'm sure I could talk to you about it for for an hour or two on end. Um, (laughs) It tends to be a balance, as you say, and oftentimes if you talk to psychiatrists, psychologists, they will say that people tend to do best, especially if they're experiencing moderate to severe degree of depression or anxiety, they tend Mm -hmm. to do best for the combination of medication, and then behavioral changes. We know from a great deal of research that exercise, for instance, can affect the brain in many of the same ways as antidepressant drugs too. So, Mm -hmm. and if you are somebody who's not comfortable with the idea of taking Prozac, or if you're experiencing side effects that are just way too much for you to handle, there are definitely mechanisms that you can look at just in terms of lifestyle change that may get you many of the same results. So I, I think it's a question of there are many different paths that can be taken and just through trial and error, each of us sort of needs to figure out what the best combination is for us. And that may include medication or it may not. In my case, you know, I've experimented with different doses of medication. I ended up on a very, very low dose that doesn't cause the side effects. So, so yeah, it, it's definitely, it, it still tends to be a process of trial and error. Yeah, that, that's you know that is very interesting because uh, you know when I when I read your eighty three percent number, then I started to realize something that in the last years I was gradually discovering is I was always surprised at what a big percentage of people I know are taking some kind of yeah you know some kind of like from benzodiazepines to other stuff you know some kind of like yeah pills you know to deal with with uh, mental issues is is actually a lot of the people, a lot of the people I know, you know, and it just matches with the percentage that your article describes, you know. So I guess, um, yeah, I guess, you know, before we go into the heroism in, in your book, which I find so fascinating, uh, I guess um, our audience could could get from this that these 17% are people who have this uh, resilience, this emotional, more emotional stability. And of course, the question is what was before the chicken or the egg, you know? Uh, you know, were they born a bit like this, or or maybe the way they were raised, their education and their own work? But 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 anyway. But there are always, uh, if we become conscious that the target is to uh, react in more moderate ways to the ups and downs of life, uh, then we can we can create a plan, right? We can we can look for strategies and and changes in our lifestyle uh, to 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 our approach. That, yeah. Absolutely. I, I would say, and through my own experience too, the good news is that even if you don't feel that you have been born or raised with these kind of emotional regulation skills, they absolutely can be learned. You know, working with a great therapist is a great way to acquire some of these skills. And so I would say those of us maybe who don't feel like we're naturally in that temperamentally blessed category there are things that we can do to sort of inch ourselves closer to that. And it, it's very worthwhile to try. And, and, you know, and I think something that, that I think is, is a, well, let's say positive in, in between like quotes uh, for everybody, but why not? Is that when, when we hear that is this 83%, then we must never, nobody, and nobody has to ever feel alone or lonely uh, when dealing with mental issues, because look, 83% pretty much means everybody, you know, and pretty much means everybody except a little minority. That's what I mean. So, so for anybody who is listening, if you are, you know, ever feeling mentally, you know, in trouble, realize that uh, most people around you are in the same situation. 
Okay, and I think this is something to keep in mind. Yeah. Absolutely, and in some ways, I wish that we could shout that 83% statistic from the rooftop so that everybody <laughs> knows this is not something to be ashamed of. We need to remove, and I, I think we're well on the way to removing that stigma, but it's still a process and we still have a ways to go, of course. I completely agree. All right, now I want to go to your amazing book. Elizabeth has written this book, What Makes a Hero? Okay, What Makes a Hero? This is a book that deals with the fascinating topic that is this, uh, you know, the, the, this uh, duality between, uh, you know, altruism, you know, uh, selflessness, suffering, uh, selfishness, you know, all this all this issue of, uh, you know, the, 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 there are two, two types of people, the people who think that altruism doesn't really exist, that uh, when we do something good for other people, it's because there is something that we're going to gain from that. Uh, there is some advantage, something we're going to get from, from that action. And there are other people who believe that, no, altruism actually exists. It, it is somewhere there. And uh, your book goes deep, deep into this. So let's begin with this question. Uh, Elizabeth, altruism is it real? Does it exist? Yeah, and actually that was one of the biggest questions I think I got from people when I started writing the book. People would come to me and they would say, well, you know that there's no such thing as real altruism, right? Like people might make a donation, but it's only so that they can see their name printed in the program, right? I mean, it, it all comes back to you. And I would say, you know, yes, maybe there is some selflessness mixed in with that altruism but the way that i ultimately i think chose to look at it is well we may have some of these selfish motivations yes and we may look down on ourselves for that but in the end the important thing is that the good thing gets done the, the people get help that need the help and so i i think it's a little bit of a waste of time to mm -hmm. castigate yourself for having a little bit of self selfish uh, motivation, like, you know, to pat yourself on the back for giving blood. It's okay. You, you know, you feel good about it. It convinces you to return again to give more blood. And so you have kind of this virtuous cycle that can get started when you feel good about having given. And so I, I think feeling good about it, getting a little bit of an ego boost from it can actually help that cycle continue. Interesting. So, yeah, so basically, uh if the action is done, uh, maybe it's not so important uh, if there is a little, uh, you know. But but I guess the question is, okay, there may be that little interest mixed with it, but do you think that even if there is that little something mixed with it, there is still, a, a, the altruism is real. It's not all of it that we're, you know, that we're going to get something from it, right? Right. And I, I think what we see is oftentimes with people who do these large scale altruistic things or who become heroes in a, a life saving sense is that they do have these truly altruistic role models in their lives. Maybe mm. they mm. have really devoted their lives to serving the community. Maybe you grow up in the family where parents really impart these values to you and live that out in their lives to where they volunteer regularly. And when you're raised, I think, in that environment, you are more likely to take on this attitude of, I am going to do good, whether or not I personally get something out of it, just because I think that that's the way a human being should behave. And I think that's where the true altruism comes in. That's very interesting. Education, education. If they if they raise you with that uh, role model, then yeah, you are most more more likely to behave like that. Very interesting. Now let's go into some specific examples because you have a lot of in interesting examples. I think one of your examples is about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a, a quadriplegic, a quadriplegic uh, a friend, a person that saves a, a life. That's that's a very. Can you tell us a bit? Uh, can you put a face to one of these uh, stories? You know. Yes, absolutely. Um, this was a skydiver, a skydiving instructor actually named Dave Hartsock, who's truly an incredible heroic personality. And what happened as I got to talk to him in person and hear about this was he was teaching uh, a student who was skydiving herself for the first time. She was a grandmother. 
Her name was Shirley. And so there are a few minutes before jumping out of the plane. And of course, she's a little bit nervous. And he reassures her and he says, no matter what happens, you're going to be in good hands with me. So don't worry. Well, what ended up happening that day was actually sort of the worst case scenario. Hmm. The two of them, it was called a tandem dive, which means that Dave is diving and then Shirley is strapped directly um, next to him, right up next to his body. And um, at a certain point in the free fall, the parachute is supposed to open, right, as you know. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened was the primary parachute did not open. Mm -hmm. There was some defect in the mechanism such that it did not open. And then the secondary parachute, which all skydiving teams have, got tangled up. And so the secondary parachute was not able to open either. And at that point, Dave really knew wow, we, we are in trouble here. And they're wow. coming to the ground hundreds of feet, you know, it's coming up on them faster and faster. And what Dave does is he makes the split second decision to rotate his body using control toggles on his garment so that he knew by doing this that when the two of them hit the ground, his body would be first to contact and would therefore absorb almost the entire impact from the fall and that that was what he was willing to do to protect his students. So that's what he does. Bam, they hit the ground. And both of them did have injuries. Shirley did have to go to the hospital, but she was in very good shape compared to Dave, who, because he did take the brunt of the impact, he ended up uh, paralyzed basically from this level of his body down. Oh. And so he, he really, he is alive today, but he made a huge sacrifice on behalf of his student. And so he truly lived up to this code that whatever the situation, you are going to put your student first and you're going to protect your student. That is unbelievable that he took that split second decision to Pretty much. I mean, if you take that decision, is you are you are almost choosing to die for that person because, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, he was paralyzed, which is obviously terrible. But but he he could have died so easily. So, wow. Yeah. Uh, well, so it's so interesting to think. Yeah, if that you know, it's so interesting to think if that decision is more of a subconscious decision or a conscious decision. If that decision is the consequence of his entire life, maybe his education, you know, his entire trajectory that almost in an automatic way makes him take the decision. Or if there is any any type of conscious uh, activity mixed with that, you know, because, because it's something that, that must have happened so quickly. Yeah. yeah, I think that is a great question. And I think what we often see in these very amazing heroic cases is through some sequence of events earlier in their lives, um, they have internalized the moral code to such an extent that while it may not have been automatic at first for them to make these kind of sacrificial decisions, it becomes automatic. So in mm -hmm. the case of Dave Hartsock, he belonged to this collective of skydivers that have a very, very strong moral code. And so in being trained to be a skydiving instructor, it was just impressed upon him over and over again that you always put your students' welfare first. It's this ironclad moral code. And so over the years, if you're exposed to that, that is going to shape and affect your behavior even in these very split second moments where you really don't have a lot of conscious time to think about it. This is so interesting. You know, it reminds me of uh, this uh, scientist and thinker, Kahneman, that wrote about the system one and system two. And, you know, I work also a lot in artificial intelligence where there is a lot of work now to try to, uh, you know, begin to work on system two. System two, the more conscious, you know, planning conscious and system one, the more automa automatic uh, subconscious tasks. And, and, and as they say, as they say, a lot of tasks begin as system two, like you plan them, you, you consciously re rehearse them, repeat them, and eventually they become system one. Like when you learn to drive and at the beginning it's very conscious and then it becomes subconscious and automatic. And I think what you are describing is a bit like that, that maybe his behavior uh, was already a system one behavior 
a consequence of all his previous uh, exposure to to this um, way of thinking, which which emphasizes the importance of education, the importance of education, the importance of of the family, of of the childhood, of course, and all of this stuff, right? Absolutely. I, I think that what I noticed in, in studying heroism, I mean, it does fit very well with Kahneman's framework. And it mm. doesn't have to involve these very large heroic acts either. It can be what the psychologist Bill Zimbardo calls acts of everyday heroism, just, you mm. know, regular helpless behavior. Does that come natural to you? Do you do it almost like an instinct that the fast thinking that, that Kahneman talks about? Um, that's something that can be ingrained in you through a similar process as Dave Hartsock's moral code as to what to do in these heart-stopping moments was ingrained into him. It, it can apply to heroic deeds at all levels of the spectrum, from sort of what you would call garden variety altruism all the way up to life-saving, incredible heroism. So I, I, I think the rest of us who are not necessarily going to save lives on a daily basis, we, we can still benefit from from this process of moving from slow to fast thinking in, in terms of altruism. Yeah, this is this is fascinating. So, uh, so exactly. So, and and you know what, what makes this makes me also think in the same way that there is placebo and nocebo, placebo and nocebo. Uh, can it happen also the opposite that you know in in a way uh, the more we resist. Or we do the opposite, the more likely we're also to not not be altruist uh, in a, a certain situation. So, so for people who are listening, if we want to become more altruist, and I guess you could also tell us what are the benefits of being altruist, I guess. And if we want to be more altruist, how is this something we can exercise, right? And how? Right. Well, I think the answer that to that fits right in with the Kahneman framework again, because what tends to make us, what researchers look at as lifelong altruists or people who really elevate this as a value, is the experience of doing the altruistic deeds over and over again, mm. getting pleasure from that. There, there's even a branch of research that talks about what's called the helper's high, like how amazing you feel when you reach out and you do things that truly make a difference, for instance, in your community. Not necessarily a life-saving act, but maybe you are mentoring a kid who needs mentoring during a really crucial time in their lives. So th things like that, when you get the helper's high, you want to do that again and again. Hmm. And over time, sort of this iterative process leads to it becoming a larger and larger part of your identity. So I would say... You know, if you haven't volunteered in a while, if you haven't done something selfless just for the sake of it, do it as an experiment, kind of see how hmm. it makes you feel. And it could be that it makes you want to do it over and over and you, you get into this virtuous cycle. This is fascinating. So we have the runners high and we have the helpers high. And so obviously these highs could be coming from evolution as well. Or they, they, there could be evolutionary roots behind, and I know you've written about that. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, the evolutionary roots of altruism and heroism? Uh, are there like some, you know, past uh, triggers there? Yeah. Yes, for sure. Well, as you know, humans are a very group-minded species. In order to survive, we had to be good at collaborating with other group members. You know, maybe one person would be the hunter, one person would take care of the kids, and you had to be able to orchestrate all that so that the team could work in harmony. So and another argument that evolutionary scientists have made is that, well, maybe the groups that were best at surviving were also the groups that were composed of many, many people that had this altruistic mindset so that over time and over generations, the groups made up of altruists would do better and, you know, grow much larger than groups where people were only out for number one and kind of at mm. each other's throats all the time. So you can see that in that context, it very much could be a survival skill to be group minded, to be generous and, and altruistic. Interesting. So it could be on in our own personal and group interest to to be to be altruists. 
Um, but of course, if we think about it that way, uh, we are approaching the side of, that, that thinks that altruism always has, uh, that, that pure altruism doesn't exist, you know? Um, right. Absolutely. And yeah, that, that's occurred to me. It, it does sort of tend to lead back to, in mm. some ways, sure, it, it benefits you, maybe it member, benefits members of your community, which makes you feel good about you. But that was one of the reasons why I eventually came to conclude, why do we have to make our motivation so pure? Why yeah. do we have to be doing good things only for others and not a little bit for ourselves? Like, it's okay, we're human. It, it, it's good to feel good about doing good. I guess. <laughs> no, I mean, you are right. At least doing good is going to help the world anyway. So at least, yeah. so, but, but going deeper, going deeper, if we think, for example, about, I don't know, I don't know, for example, Mother Theresa of Cal Calcutta, yeah? Mother Theresa mm -hmm. of Calcutta. Or, I don't know, or, or one of us that decides to leave everything and go to Africa, go to India and just dedicate uh, themselves to help the, the, the people in there. Uh, do you think that some people who do this, this can be a, and connecting with the mental health that we talked about before, this can be a compensating mechanism to escape, in a way, uh, their dark uh, demons, in a way. Uh, that I mean, what you said, that by looking for the helpers high, uh, in a way, they are trying to run away from, from their own internal darkness. Yes, I, I think that could definitely be a possibility. And that just underscores why we shouldn't exclusively be chasing the helpers high, because if that is the only and the main thing that motivates you, you're not going to be that focused on, okay, I want to be a helper, but what do the people that I'm helping actually need? So, sometimes you have like pathological altruism where people think they're going in and helping but they're actually mm. imposing their own vision of what people's lives should mm. be yeah. on the people that they think that they're helping. So it's very important to have an orientation toward the others that, that you want to help. Because if you are not working with them as a team, then you're really probably more harming than helping. This is, this is super interesting. And do you think that is there a way... Uh, you know, for, for people who may be listening to us, I mean, is there a way in which we can detect if our own motivations, when we are helping, when we're being altruist, if our own motivations are coming from here or from here, you know, if our own motivations are more, I would say more oriented towards the people who are, we are helping or more oriented towards ourselves? ourselves you know because i think this probably makes a difference right i mean are we are we helping because our empathy is really focused on the object we are helping you know this the subject we are helping or are we helping but the focus is more on us right right and i i think people who truly want to be helpers they ask themselves these questions all the time and it's important to hmm. continually be asking ourselves these questions and also getting feedback from people we admire maybe people who are our role models in helping am i doing this right like are my motivations in the right place and then continually going back to the community that you intend to help and getting their feedback. I, I feel like that is probably exactly. the most important feedback. If you think that you're helping, but the feedback that you're hearing from the community members is, no, you are coming in and you are imposing your vision on us, then that really is a sign that you need to go back and reformulate your plan totally. So I, I think just getting that outside feedback from as many sources as possible, people you admire, but especially, most especially, the people that you're helping. I think this is a great point that you say, because I think uh, 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 most people are very sensitive to detect, you know, what we call bullshit, you know, like BS, right? So I think many people are very sensitive to this, and, and it's exactly by listening to the feedback that you get, uh, that we all get when we try to help in some way, I think if we are really sensitive to that feedback, we will probably be able to understand if, if, if we are doing things for the right reason. Yeah. So right. uh, I, I want to go back because the story of the skydiver is incredible. And I think it's a beautiful example of, of 
probably all the influences that he had during his life that brought him to, to do this, such an amazing, beautiful act at that point. Uh, can you tell us, because I know in your book you go through a number of examples, can you give us maybe another, uh, put another face, give us another example of uh, heroism that uh, you personally find fascinating? Absolutely. Well, there are so many to choose from. And <laughs> my most recent book, I, I actually was able to interview heroes that were kids and teens and still don't, doing these most amazing things. and. One of the stories I think that sticks out the most in my mind is a teenager named Grace Ann Rumor, who, she was about 17 years old, she was a senior in high school, and one just a regular day after school, she got on the bus with kids all different ages, and she sat down and she kind of said to her friend, this day has really wiped me out, I'm just so tired, I really want to take a nap. But it was only a few minutes into the bus ride that things turned around totally. What happened was the bus driver collapsed at the wheel. Um, he was having a heart attack, although she didn't know that at the time. And the bus basically being uncontrolled, it was just careening into oncoming traffic. And the kids in the bus were sort of screaming. And somebody nearby said to Grace Ann, hey, you just got your license, didn't you? Go, go drive the bus. And at first she thought, you know, this sort of sounds crazy. How am I going to, I've never driven like a huge bus before. But through whatever she had in her, she was able to do it. She rushed to the front of the bus, grabbed the wheel and steered the bus out of oncoming traffic wow. right to the side of the road. And Ooh. as a result, you know, all, all those kids were able to stay safe. There, there were no accidents. They were all able to go home to their families. Ooh that night so that especially since she was so young that really stuck with me that is very beautiful and she as you said she was very young so in that case um i wonder what type of uh, yeah i wonder in that case because being so young there must have been i mean obviously she, she couldn't have been exposed to a lot of similar situations before right Right, it, exactly. And, you know, what, what I got from talking to her is that she felt very uncertain. She was scared. And mm. talking to heroes, like many of them are very, very scared in the moment that they take action. It's a myth that this is very interesting because you're not going to feel that fear. That, that's really a myth. This is very interesting because I think you said that somebody proposed her to do it, right? Yeah, it was just a suggestion. You know, one of the other kids threw it out there, but she was very adaptable. She sort of seized on that. And she realized, I think, being one of the oldest kids on the bus, maybe I'm the only one who can solve this problem right here. Maybe I'm the only one who can act most effectively to, to be of service. That's very, very interesting. Because being so young, uh, I guess there could be influence from the family, obviously, the, the, the childhood. Um, but very, very impressive when it's at that young age, because I don't think that could be already system one. I mean, it's, she, she hasn't had so many experiences like that. Uh, right. That's a very hopeful yeah. story. Uh, that's a very beautiful story. Yeah, no, there's still a lot of mystery to it, though. You're right. And even after all these years of studying heroism, I have to admit to you that I really am not sure what I would do if I were in that kind of life or death situation. And I had to make a decisive act. I... You know, I'm, I'm not sure if any of us really know until we're there. You are, you are very right because, yeah, because, I mean, my my intuition, my intuition is to think that if we, as adults, if we are in a situation like that, we are probably going to react almost in aut autopilot, you know, and uh, and it will probably depend what we do on all that previous, all our previous life and etc. Et but you are right. But I have no idea, and you don't have idea, and I, I don't have idea myself how I would. Reacting such a, so you've never been in a in a in an in a extreme situation like that, right? No, and in some ways, I I'm thankful that I've never <laughs> sure. faced that kind of difficulty. But um, that's one reason that I look up so much to the people that have been there and that were able to rise above the situation, even in that extreme moment. It's it's just mind boggling, but it, it's really an example for all of us to to aspire to. And I think by internalizing these stories of heroism, that, that does have an impact on our thinking in ways that we might not always be aware of. So it, it's good to expose ourselves to these stories.
No, I agree. And I think uh, what we're, I think what I'm taking from this uh, part of the conversation is, uh, is that it's not so important that it's not so important uh, if, you know, if we are going to benefit in some way from, from this altruism. I think what is important is, is to be alert to the feedback, as you said, that we receive when Absolutely. we are altruist. And, and that feedback will tell us uh, if we are doing things from the right place uh, in the right way. And, and if that's the case, then it can only be good because we're obviously we're helping them. Yeah. Right. Um, and what I see more and more is nothing can be done without community. Anyway, a lot of the most effective heroes are people who have a team behind them. And, you know, mm -hmm. even the most ambitious person, they can't handle everything. If you have Mo Mother Teresa, she had a large team of people behind her who, who were on the same page as her and helping her in her efforts. So I think when you're sort of embedded in that kind of team, you're going to be getting that feedback and you just have to be humble enough to incorporate that. And so that that's where the importance of humility comes in. Yeah, I have a connecting with that. Then I have a before we go to the dinosaurs, uh, I have a, a doubt. Uh, is there a correspondence? Like, you know, people who have a lot of money and a lot of power, uh, is there a connection with how this power impacts their altruism? And vice mm -hmm. versa, people who are very poor, people who are very poor and have uh, very few things, is there a correlation? Are there correlations between these two extremes? People with very little, people with, with a lot? Yes. I mean, there's not a ton of research on this, but one study that I have seen showed that people who make less money do tend to donate to charity a larger proportion of their income. So even if they're not making a lot, mm -hmm. and even if they're not giving a lot in absolute numbers, they are giving more of what they make. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, sometimes I, I do wonder, is being in this privileged position, is that making us more removed from what other people are going through and therefore less likely to be motivated to help? It's a great question and I think one that needs to be explored even more. So what you just said, just to clarify, is that the people who make more, they, they give, you said more or less? Less, so less. lower percentage. Less. What no they give a percentage. lower percentage of what they have than people yeah. who have less. People exactly. who have yeah. less give more percentage. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I, I was. That's that's what I was expecting. Yeah, that's what I was expecting. Yeah, that people who make more they give less. Yeah, yeah. This is this is what I was expecting, and uh, yeah, it would be very interesting to uh, what you just mentioned. Maybe they they feel more removed, uh, more farther away from the needs of other people, uh, and I wonder. I wonder if this could be. Uh, if something could be done to change that, but uh, I guess it all goes back to education, probably, um, because because yeah. there are some people who are very powerful. There, you know, there are some people who are very powerful and 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 have a lot of uh, you know money and everything who who don't behave like that. You know, but uh, maybe they are the minority, right? Yeah. Right, and I I think motivation is extremely important. You know, you can give somebody the best motivation, but if they're not really motivated to help, that education is going to go nowhere. So, totally. Yeah. All right, now I want to switch to something completely different because that's uh, it's uh, about the Beyond podcast. We go when I go beyond even the Beyond. So, what about the dinosaurs and this detective work that you were involved? Because this is very fascinating. I want to uh, shake the mind of the uh, audience by now moving on to dinosaurs and detective work. Tell us about this. Yeah, definitely for a big shift. So yeah, I, I wrote a piece a few years ago about some of these paleontologists who are, their primary interest is not in dinosaur skeletons, but in dinosaur tracks. And mm. so o over the years, some of these tracks have been fossilized because if sediment fills in the prints in just the right way, and the rock forms in just the right way, the tracks can be preserved. And the thing that's interesting about the tracks that you don't get from skeletons is some indications about how dinosaurs actually lived on a day-to-day -day basis and how they behaved. You know, did they congregate in herds? Were they more loners? Um, what kind of environments did they tend to hang out in? Was it the swamp? Was it the plains, um, and by looking at the sediments that these tracks are made in, you can put together 
some of these pieces. And I sort of shadowed a very intrepid paleontologist for a few days while I was writing the story. And one of the things he said to me was something like, even the best pr preserved skeleton is still a corpse, right? <laughs> yeah. But these tracks are alive in a way that a skeleton is not. It shows us where the dinosaurs were, what they were doing. And that's where the detective work piece comes in, trying to figure out from these pieces of evidence, from these tracks, what may their behaviors have been like. This is fascinating. I had never considered how the tracks of the dinosaur uh, could be so useful in comparison to the skeleton. But yeah, it makes sense because I guess, uh, you know, that when, when, you, when you step on the, on, the, on the grass, on the ground, uh, when you leave tracks behind, it's your entire body that is really leaving the track. It's not just the foot. It's your entire self that is making right. the track. So there is a lot of information there, right? And, 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 and I, Absolutely. I'm, and paths yeah. of travel, you can see maybe where the dinosaurs were headed. Where did they start? Where are they going? Depending on how significant the preserved track line is. Now, of course, there are many different levels of quality and preservation. And um, the detectives, they can't really control all of that. They just have to work with what they have. And the interesting thing is that sometimes the tracks are... Um, Car like scooped out the way you would expect when a footprint is made, but other times they're sort of reverse tracks. Like you'll see them in the ceiling somewhere because at some point in time, a sediment filled in the track and then the fill-in survived, but the original track did not. So you have sort of these inside out dinosaur tracks. And so it was, yeah, just, just a fossilized fill-in sediment, but the layer below did not get fossilized. Oh, that's fascinating. Wow. And you know, and this yeah, makes me think, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this makes me think of these, you know, sticking out tracks and it's wild. It's like another, nothing you ever imagined. Yeah, sticking out the tracks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. And you know, and this makes me think of our own tracks, the tracks that we, I mean, because, you know, recently I, I read a study or something that said that uh, one way to detect when people are aging, I mean, how people are aging is that they begin to move slower, you know, and the way they walk. So I guess for us humans, there must also be a lot of information in our own tracks, how we walk, how fast we walk, the rhythm, the type of step, the, the, the gait, the, the entire thing. There must be, uh, I, I guess there must be a lot of people researching on this as well, our own. Yeah, and of course we have an unprecedented level of data about this because we have step counters that are recording all these things. Yes. Um, even just my iPhone, it records, am I walking flat? Am I going upstairs? Oh. Yeah, like, and so I'm sure that the right researchers could mine that and figure out lots of things about how I lead my life, what, what is my current state of health, and yeah, it, it's fascinating to consider. Yes, for everybody who's listening, walk faster. Just walk faster, okay? Because they say that's good. Okay, so I can't believe that we're almost, we're already entering the last part of the, the, of the conversation. This is, has gone so fast because it's so fascinating. So for our last topic, one that is very, very, very special to me, I'm very interested in because, you know, I've worked a lot in the topic of um, uh, brainstorming, you know, creativity, creative thinking, ideation, uh, innovation, uh, and this is the topic of, well, you know, IQ tests, you know, IQ tests, um, intelligence and IQ tests. And you wrote this article. And the question is that a lot of people say, right, that the way that IQ tests are being done. And for example, I've researched a lot about the, the theory of multiple intelligences also. You know, do we have an intelligence that can be expressed through different channels, emotional intelligence, uh, musical, mathematical intelligence, or is there just one, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, now a lot of people say that these IQ tests, in a way, they tend to evaluate abilities that are important in the eyes of Western culture, because this is where all of it comes from. So what, do you, what can you tell us about this? I mean, are IQ tests really... Can they be objective or, or are they just a, a, a very like a narrow, distorted perspective that comes from Western culture? Right. Well, there is definitely some cultural weighting. If you look at Lewis Terman, who was one of the researchers that developed the 
um, Stanford Bennett IQ test. He was this white guy. He was pretty well off. Um, he was a professor at Stanford. So he came from this very specific social space. And so, of course, that is going to influence the type of test that he creates and the types of knowledge that he privileges. And so somebody who is not coming from that same background is not necessarily going to score as well on that test. They may have abilities that are adapted to perform well in a very different type of environment, but the IQ test simply is not measuring that. Great, great. So the question is, do we need IQ tests? And if we need them, how should they be then? Right. Well, I, I think as a society, this is something we're sort of trying to figure out. I, I do think there's been a shift away from looking at the IQ test as the arbiter of what kind of status you get. We see here in the U.S. Um, the SAT, which is sort of a glorified IQ test in many ways, universities used to give that score a lot more weight than they currently do. You, you know, some give it more weight than others, but I think the trend is toward looking at, well, what does a person actually do in the world? Like, how well did they learn mathematics? How, how well did they mm. write? As opposed to how good are they at sorting pieces into a pattern that the IQ test shows you. Um, and, and so looking more at achievement and accomplishment rather than potential. Like the IQ test says that it measures a very specific kind of potential, but there's a huge gap between the potential and the actual. There are a lot of people that score very, very well on IQ tests and then don't end up doing a whole lot with their lives. So um, I, I think we're starting to wake up to that as a culture, which I think is a very, very comforting thing. Yeah, I, I was actually about to ask you about that. Uh, do you think that being very intelligent is an advantage or a disadvantage? <laughs> that, that's a great question. Well, it depends what kind of intelligence you're talking about, of course. Is it the yes. kind of the IQ test measure? Is it a different kind? So I, I'm not sure that it's a question that can even be yeah. answered satisfactorily. Okay, but, what but we could go... Is, yeah. We, then we could start, actually, because I was going to ask you this anyway. Let's go... To, the, to intelligence itself. In your opinion, in your opinion, and, and there are like a trillion opinions about this, but your, your opinion, what is intelligence? And is there just, in your opinion, there's one kind of different kinds? And what is it? You know? Well, I think in the most basic sense, it's the ability to respond to the information that's coming at us and mm. process it in a way that benefits us or benefits the people around us. But I mean, that, that is a very, very vague definition. And that, that's why there are so many, you know, zillions of different definitions of intelligence in the first place. So yeah. very, very tricky. But what I do think is harmful is sometimes when kids are raised, you know, maybe you have a kid, they do very, very well on the standardized test, they get an IQ score. And what that does is it sets up these high, high expectations for that kid, which, you, you know, they may or may not meet, but it, I, I think it can put a lot of pressure on that child and encourage them not to take the risks that they need to take to make mistakes, to learn. Um, they feel like they have to be performing at this high level all the time, and so they become perfectionistic. They become afraid of, of risk, of challenge, and that's the last thing that we want in, in people who are supposed to do great things in their lives. We need to get used to failure. We need to get used to making mistakes. And I, I think holding up these high standards for kids, it, it's it's very toxic in that way. Yeah, this is uh, very interesting what you tell me because just uh, today I was speaking with uh, David, a friend of mine, and he was telling me about Einstein, that uh, it was when Einstein, he was telling me, when Einstein was uh, rejected for a position in, uh, I don't remember, I think for a PhD in university, uh, and then he started to work in the patent office. Uh, it is because of that rejection that then he got all this time to to reflect and think about physics and everything. Uh, and I guess there are a lot of examples in life of people that conventionally they failed uh, and then they went on to succeed bigger than anybody else that goes the conventional way. So, um, so I guess... 
the definition of what also disconnects with what how people define success. And uh, I guess a lot of people are also in autopilot in terms of defining what success is, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And if you're very successful along traditional metrics, you're going to have less and less motivation to want to succeed in unconventional ways that might actually be groundbreaking. Um, what uh -huh. we see in some of these long-term studies of high IQ individuals is they really like to color within the lines. They don't tend to be these path-breaking people that create new disciplines. Um, they just, from childhood, they, they've been raised to perform according to the conventional standard. And that's not universal. It's just a tendency that they have that I think is important to be aware of if you really want to be one of these pathbreakers. This is super interesting that the, 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 the fact that the, in a way, the more intelligence you have, the less risks you may take as well. And I think this reminds me of something else you've written about. There is a connection between suffering as well and self selflessness. Um, mm -hmm. what, what is the role in our last minutes? What is the role of suffering? You know, how is suffering connected to, you know, going back to the, uh, heroism, selflessness, altruism, and mental health, uh, because it's all connected in a way. But what is the right. thing here? What's the role? Right. Well, since we just have a little bit of time, I'll do sort of the elevator pitch version of this. But basically, the idea is that when you go through something that's difficult, that really changes you and challenges you, you have this very direct firsthand experience of how hard it is to go through something like that, whether it's a natural disaster, whether you go through a very severe episode of depression. And in some people that can be motivating so that, for instance, if you encounter somebody else who's gone through a natural disaster or, you know, going through an existential crisis in life, it is easier for you to empathize with that person as a result of the experience that you had and so you can help them through that. Um, I talked to a woman, Jody Blanco, who is a very important anti-bullying activist who was bullied herself terribly at a young age. And one of the things that she said to me was, if you were in this situation, if you were being bullied, wouldn't you want somebody who's been through this before to be the one to reach out their hand and and help you out. And so I, I think that development of empathy as, as a result of difficult experience is something that we shouldn't underestimate. This is very, very interesting. This is fascinating because they, they, I mean, it, it makes all the sense that if you've suffered yourself certain situations, uh, you may have more empathy for people that may go through those situations. Now, what happens <laughs> with people that may have a very easy life, very easy childhood, very easy everything, are these people in general, do they have more problems to empathize with others? Is there, are there studies about this? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there have been studies of people who've had super easy lives specifically. They have studied people who have had difficult lives and they've shown mm -hmm. that they do tend to have more empathy and they do tend to have more motivation to help other people who are in a similar situation. But, but yeah, I'm not sure if anybody has looked at the flip side of that what are the results of having a very easy, you know, coasting along type of life in terms of altruism and selflessness? I'm not sure if anybody has done that work, but if they have, I'd be very interested to see it. Yeah, me too. Me too. Well, this is like, oh my God, this, uh, this is all so interesting. It, it could be easily a 10 hour conversation. But, uh, well, but we are reaching our hour and just to complete this fascinating conversation and to close it, um, like we do in many of the episodes, um, could you give us a bit, um, because you know, you've, you've researched about these universal topics from suffering to selflessness to altruism um, and around it all is life. Life itself, this thing that begins and then one day ends. Um, what is your, your own personal motivation in life? I mean, what is in your view what makes life worth? Uh, living and uh, where how do we find the, the meaning in life and how do you find it? I think 
what I've seen over and over again is that if I'm going through a tough period, what tends to happen is uh, I focus too much on my own problems. I turn inward. But the times in my life when I really felt most satisfied or most fulfilled is when I felt like I've contributed something much larger than myself that goes way beyond the ego, whether it's writing that might reach somebody who's in a difficult place or um, mentoring kids who are looking for a path in life or looking to be able to define it. Th those are the times when I felt like this is really what life is supposed to be, that this is what I want. And, you know, what I hope is that other people can find those things beyond themselves. And it, it's a little bit of a paradox that turning toward others, turning away from yourself is what's going to make you most fulfilled. But this is something that philosophers and sages have been talking about for hundreds of years. It's just kind of something that we each have to learn as well through experience. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Turning, turning that focus away from us and towards, towards the others. That's beautiful. Beautiful way of completing this beautiful conversation. Elizabeth, thank you so much. I remind everybody the book of Elizabeth, uh, uh, which is called? It's called What Makes a Hero? The Surprising Science of Selflessness. And then I also have a kid's book called The Life Heroic. Perfect. And they can be found in Amazon, I guess, right? And, and yes, yes. Amazon, Amazon or whatever, whatever bookstore, um, most of the online booksellers, yes. Perfect. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for connecting. And uh, really, I really enjoyed this conversation. All the best. Yes, thank you so much, Javier. I really enjoyed our talk. Thank you for following the Beyond podcast. If you enjoy it, subscribe on YouTube and support it in other channels like Patreon and others. And hope to see you soon at the Beyond Podcast. Thank you.